part of Rebel Wisdom's sense-making series. In the first film, called What the F*** is Going On, I talked about how the pandemic had acted a bit like a catalyst and an amplifier of what was already there. The psychologist Stanislav Grof talked about altered states, and especially psychedelics, as non-specific amplifiers, just making everything more intense, whether good or bad. So if this has been a bit of a joint psychedelic trip, how do we navigate it? I thought the best person to speak to was Eric Davis, who's one of the foremost historians of psychedelic culture. He's the author of many different books, including High Weirdness, where he looks at three key figures in the counterculture movement, Robert Anton Wilson, Terence McKenna, and Philip K. Dick. And this is what he had to say. Eric, really good. Thank you for making time for the conversation. Yeah, no, good to be here. Cool. So the reason that I'm really keen to talk to you, Eric, is that you're one of the kind of foremost historians of weirdness, strangeness, and the sort of the pioneers of that in the 60s and 70s. And since this pandemic has kind of been ramping up and so much has changed, I've had this real sense of the pandemic and the lockdown as this sort of non-specific amplifier. I, I'm, I'm reminded of Stan Groff, Stanislav Groff, the, the amazing um, psychologist and pioneer of psychedelic therapy, talked about psychedelics as a non-specific amplifier. So it just made everything more intense. And it feels a lot like this is what's been happening in our culture. I, I want to start just asking you, we'll, we'll, we'll get on to some of the, 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 the figures from the 60s and 70s and what we might be able to learn from them. But what... What do you feel about that frame, like the, the pandemic and this kind of time we're going through as a non-specific amplifier? I think it's a wonderful frame in the sense that it, it forces us to reflect on our own reactions at least as much as our ideas about what are, what's causing those reactions. He's in a way saying the experience is not caused by LSD. What causes your experience is your own set and setting, your own even physiological set being stimulated by this nonspecific or amplified by this nonspecific factor. So what that means with acid is it's like, don't go, oh, the LSD told me this, or the LSD made me do this or, or so. It's more like, wow, I have now an opportunity to see how I respond or what gets amplified when I in encounter this particular marvelous uh, chemical. So if I have a great Psychedel, you know, if I have a visionary experience, that's something of mine. If I have a hell trip, it's something I have to kind of reflect on. And so in that sense, I think it's a really wonderful way to, uh, but again, to push it back onto our own reactions, meaning both how we're processing and thinking about what's happening out there. But it also, I think, helps explain the surreality or weirdness of the situation we're in because it's not like there's a specific event that we're all reacting to more or less the same it's that there's a nebulous largely invisible you know distributed event that actually i don't really see too much in my life i see the signs of it or how other people are interpreting it but it's very nebulous it's like a invisible bomb went off and we're kind of in the the uh you know the aftershock of it but we don't we can't really locate where did it happen what's going on and so there's a there's a surreal quality to it because you can you you have to kind of navigate other people's projections and fears and narratives even as you're sort of struggling to come up with your own and resist ones that are starting to over, you know, overly impinge on you or being attracted to ones that make you feel more afraid. And you're like, so we're, we're in a kind of lightly psychedelic state where there's multiple narratives, multiple, multiple possibilities, multiple emotional reactions that have a kind of excessive, surreal, uh, dreamlike quality, even the way that these polarized political events have just finally revealed that the sort of media as some kind of coherent maintainer of consensus reality is, is just gone, really. I mean, there are individuals and individual organs that are doing good work and, you know, it's complicated. But the overall sense that we have now entered into some kind of media implosion is also part of this sense of the surreal. So it is also an interesting kind of opportunity 
to like pedal to the metal with your spiritual practice, your psychological practice, your like, like this is where clear, clear thinking starts to actually have a, an active feedback process that improves the quality of your life and improves your ability to not be swamped by what's going on. And to me, you know, you can, you don't need to invoke psychedelics to talk about that sort of intelligence or that sort of process or practice at all. But in my life, it is partly about having been a psychedelic person for a very long time and going through very strange experiences and quasi psychotic experiences and dangerous experiences and delightful experiences and processing that that has come to allow me a certain kind of flexibility around both nightmare scenarios, paranoid scenarios, but also a sense of the almost humor of being in the midst of difficult situations and just plunging forward with a certain kind of uh, joie de vie and also a, a celebration of the ways that people can come together who are similarly going through difficult situations and you can actually improve the quality of your communication and of your perception of the world. And even if that perception can be very difficult, yeah, I mean, there's so much to pick up on and what you were just saying. But the one thing that really came through, partly when you were talking about the media as well, is this sort of sense of narrative collapse. But I also wanted to bring in the concept of spiritual emergency, because this is, again, coming from Stan Groff, is probably the one who's done the most work on this. But the sense of that we're in a kind of medical paradigm uh, that, that often pathologizes altered states, often pathologizes spiritual experience. And he came up with the concept of spiritual emergency to talk about anything that didn't, an altered state or a transformational process that didn't really fit into a Western medical model and would often be labeled as, as psy, um, psychosis or mania or some of those. And it feels... I've had experiences like that, or I understand, and I understand a lot of what that feels like. And often what I found that would come up in those spiritual emergencies is a lot of the, the buried stuff from the past, stuff that I hadn't dealt with from childhood or stuff that I hadn't dealt with from my, my upbringing, my conditioning. And it feels to me, especially in the last few weeks where we see all of this repressed stuff from the American culture, from the British culture, just coming up, it feels to me like the, the entire culture is in the middle of some kind of spiritual emergency. Would you, would you agree with that? Are you sort of seeing the same kind yeah, of Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I mean, because in a way, spiritual emergency is the best model you have to, as an alternate to breakdown and psychosis. I mean, that's kind of what he's saying. He's saying, look, if you have somebody, maybe they're tripping or maybe they're not even tripping. They're just going through a point, part of their life and they start to have these symptoms that conventional science is going to say, or medicine is going to say, oh, they're psychotic or they're bipolar. He want, uh, Groff wanted to say, look, there's another way of framing it. And there was a lot of stuff like that in the 60s and 70s. It was a whole anti-psychiatry moment. There was a whole attempt to reframe difficult altered states as potentially valuable as even trauma. You know, that, that's actually a very interesting thing, a very important difference between our era now and that era that people don't talk about enough. It's really key to understand if you're, if you're thinking in terms of that connection. And then I'll, I'll go on more about now is in a sense, a lot of people in the 60s embraced trauma as a rite of passage into a new state. So the idea that taking a huge dose of psychedelics is gonna tear you apart it opens up the possibility you walk out on the other side and you've left a lot of stuff behind. A lot of the ideas about having um, extraordinary experience, enlightenment experience. In fact, the, that era's whole quest for radical, intense experiences was partly justified because lots of people, you know, people on the street, psychiatrists, people at Esalen, et cetera, et cetera, had this idea that there was a kind of a cleansing craziness at the far end of which was the opportunity to reconstruct in a new way. And we don't think that way anymore. You know, we are much more scared about trauma and how trauma, you can't get out of it or it tears things down. And there's, we're not, you know, we're on, almost on the opposite where we don't even want to trigger past trauma. And that, that those two differences are very important. They help explain a lot of the ways that contemporary 
uh, discourse around psychedelics is so different uh, than it used to be. But I think it's also in some ways not setting us up as well as it could be for what we're going through. Because what we're going through, like you say, does have the character of some return of the repressed or some kind of now I have to actually look at not just aspects of myself, but aspects of reality. It's like if you've if you've kind of been in your bubble your whole life and then finally you have the opportunity to really absolutely existentially recognize that you are going to die and you can't layer anything on top of it, that is a traumatic experience or can be. It can also be an illuminating experience and there can be illumination in the trauma and that's it gets really complicated. One of the things that I'm talking about with all three of the characters that I write about it, I think one of the things that's sort of unique about my approach is that a lot of uh, accounts, they will either stress the psychopathology or they'll stress the spirituality. So you take someone like Alan Watts, you know, and Alan Watts comes off as a really groovy, mellow guy who's on top of him and stuff, but his actual life is kind of a mess. And in some ways he was sort of a, a dark character and, 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 you know, whatever, it's complicated, but he, 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 you know, he was an alcoholic. He died of alcoholism. Uh, he was a womanizer. He was, a, you know, he had a lot of issues with control or self-control. And so when you start to look at the philosophy, you go, huh, what's going on here? It gets complicated. But some, most people would either say, you know, some dark, bi negative biographers would go, oh, he was just a reprobate. He couldn't deal with it. And all, everything else is just a justification for that. And then a lot of the kind of, you know, spiritual new age thing, they don't think about that. They just talk about his brilliant ideas. But it's a mix. It's on a continuum. And the three guys that I talk about, they, are, they all spend time in something like psychosis or something like paranoid pathology, some, some quite repeatedly in the case of Philip K. Dick. But they also were spiritual figures. They also had prophetic visionary experiences that had integrity and, and consequence and richness. They also all reflected philosophically on things and, and that there's a continuum there. And so you, the fact that there's psychosis in the picture or the fact that there's social breakdown or the fact that there is a, a, a big uptick in, uh, in mental disturbance doesn't mean just the whole thing is unraveling. It also means there are other possibilities that are open. And I, you know, a, a, a more positive view of, let's say in, in, in the United States in the last few weeks, the extraordinary energy of these demonstrations, which which have a different character than the many demonstrations. Throughout my whole life, I've been going to demonstrations, but there's this futility around them. They seem stale. There's something, we haven't we done this already? But these are different. You know, there's something else is kind of constellating. Uh, so I think spiritual emergency is a great way to look at it. And I, again, it's also because I do think that in a non-narcissistic way, this is a spiritual opportunity. And I say that because spirituality uh, has been hijacked in the last couple of decades by narcissistic consum consumerism. Not entirely, but many things that started out at the very least as kind of interesting, playful, creative spaces, yoga in America, whatever, you know, all these things. You could just watch as they became more successful. They allowed people to actually close off and kind of enter into their own little world view and sort of pamper themselves and, and hide in a way in their hipness or in their whatever it is. And right now it's like, okay, you got, are you guys still into your spirituality? You're still doing your yoga, still doing your practice, still doing your psychedelics, still, you know, doing your celebrations. Well, if you are now, you're either completely disconnected because you're not paying attention to the crisis in the world or you're having to re, you know, reconstitute the connections between your practices and the world in a way that I think can actually help both sides of the equation. So we're actually at a point where things that have been sort of absorbed into business as usual, consumerism as usual, narcissistic social media self-promotion as usual, now are like, okay, we're here. You know, actually, we can be used in different ways. And one of the ways that that happens is that spirituality is a way to get you through spiritual emergency. Another way of saying that is that religion in the broadest sense, particularly religious practices, not so much the ideas or ideology, reading this, your belief about Jesus or whatever, but the practices, the daily practices, the, the processes of emotion, of 
how do you process other people that kind of that kind of world that stuff you know is is in a way designed to deal with psycho with our own psychopathological capacity it's it's not that you know people you know people make that point they'll say oh look at religion it's just kind of ocd you know look at those guys they have their little rituals they do every day and and you oh it's just a, you know it's it's just sort of a, a regressive form of behavior why don't we look at it the other way which is actually that's a way of of dealing with our own capacities to go crazy or to lose the plot or to break down or to weep or to i mean not weeping is bad but i mean to like you know lose it in in terrible gr nameless grief can't really get out of and so i i feel like our opportunity our time around was also an opportunity to reframe a lot of these practices as you know tools for survival you've spent probably as long as anyone looking at weirdness altered states and the kind of the the people who navigated that in the 60s and 70s who do you think are the key people to pay attention to and what do you think are the the best tips for kind of navigating this space that we're in now well you know it's funny i started out really just being interested in the problem of how do individuals deal with these extraordinary, bizarre experiences where, that are sort of equally composed of psychosis and religion? And uh, in kind of looking at what they were doing, I, I, I felt like I figured out some navigational tips uh, that weirdly seemed to apply to much more things than I thought I was talking about initially. And uh, one of those things is what I call the tightrope walk. And so in all three of the cases that I was looking at in high weirdness, Philip Gay Dick, Terrence McKenna, and Robert Anton Wilson, they're all having these bizarre experiences, not always from the same time. Two of them took a lot of psychedelics. Dick didn't take too much psychedelics. He was more of a natural. But in any case, they were spending a lot of time in these visionary worlds with paranoid implications and loads of synchronicities. And, you know, they were really getting on, out on the edge. But unlike a lot of people who are either typical paranoids or religious visionaries, they also kind of resisted what they were experiencing. And they did it partly through humor and they did it partly through uh, skepticism. And this is to me one of the really important transformations that happens with psychedelic experience is that up to psychedelic experience, most people who have visionary experiences that don't just become completely crazy, they tend to really believe them. That's kind of the history of religion is you have like this extraordinary experience and you're like, I had this experience. I was talking to an angel. He gave me a book. Let's go for it. You know, and whether it's, you know, uh, uh, people in, you know, the 19th century or back in ancient, in the ancient world. But psychedelics introduce a new thing in the equation, which is that you can have an extraordinary experience visionary experience with uh, religious implications, apocalyptic implications, messianic implications, you know, I know, I see the world. And then you wake up the next day and you go, whoa, what was that? And you kind of almost have a choice. Do you hold on to that visionary conviction? Or do you go, okay, something more is going on here. Or that has to also be integrated into this. Or what do we do? What do we do with this? And that was part of my question is what do we do with this? So I was interested in, in the way that these guys also resisted it. And it has to do with this quality of skepticism and with what I would call ordinary reason. And I, I like to distinguish reason from rationality. Like to me, the way I'm using it right here, right now, rationality is kind of like an attempt to, to support and understand these large systems of explanations that can account for a greater and greater percentage of reality. So you're like, I'm into whatever, it's mathematics, it's logical relations, these large systems that help us understand the world. And I'm not saying that those systems aren't groovy, but that's not what I'm talking about. By reason, I mean something that's a little bit more um, close to home. It's like, is this gonna be good for me? Is it not gonna be good for me? What if I do that, it's gonna be this. And it's like, hi, huh, I, I feel this about this person, but, I don't really trust it. I think I might be running one of my own trips. You know, that kind of sense of, of bringing a, a skeptical quality to your own experience as a way to help you navigate through life better. 
Uh, and that quality these guys all had in really interesting ways. Not all the time. Sometimes they lost the plot. But a lot of time they were able to go through these extremely bizarre experiences, but kind of keep their feet on the ground. And the metaphor I came up with this that I think is actually very helpful for us is this idea of being on a, on a tightrope. You know, you're no longer on solid ground. In some sense, your own responses create the gravity that allows you not to fall. And, you, and, you're, and you've got this nice instrument and the instrument is kind of like ordinary reason. It's like, well, it might be this, well, I don't know about that. Let's, that's a little bit much. And so you kind of keep your own interior balance of awareness, your eyes are open, you're responding to all the shifts of the situation you're in, you've got your hands on some of the stuff you really know, things about psychology, things about you know, how, how the mind processes things, certain skeptical ideas about believing, over-believing our own experiences, a certain quality of kind of organic skepticism. And then with all that, you can go farther and farther and farther into the screaming void. And that is a kind of, that's, those, that's a good, handy tip for, for you know, far, far out voyaging in psychedelics. It's a handy tip for when you, you're losing the plot for whatever reason, you, synchronicities, crazy stuff in your life, uh, terrible grief. When you start to kind of really lose co connection with things and you're like, oh, here we go. There's still these threads of, of a certain kind of, okay, now I'm on the tightrope. Now I gotta like try to do my best I can. Sometimes you fall, but then you get to get it back up most of the time. And I, I really think that this was something that these guys were kind of exploring. And another analogy for it that you get in Robert Anton Wilson that I also think is really applicable to, uh, to today, to aspects of today, particularly if you're thinking about conspiracy theory uh, and how easily it is for people to get absorbed into conspiracy narratives today, which is a fascinating thing. It's, it's for me, under, trying to grapple with conspiracy theory today and I admit that the term conspiracy theory is problematic and we have to historicize it and it doesn't mean there aren't conspiracies, blah, 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 blah. It's always important to say these things because there's a lot of mainstream talk about conspiracy theory that's really pretty stupid. Uh, but for me to really grapple with it in, in its complexity is not just like a sidelight. It's not like, oh yeah, all the deplorables over here are getting into conspiracy theory and all the smart people are trying to keep the, the ship going. It's not like that. It's much more symptomatic and it's much more central, I think, to as a sign of what's happening with media, with consensus reality, with the narrative wars, with weaponized multi-layered narratives where certain narratives are put forward to because they feed these other narratives that are being controlled from a third position. You know, all of those scary, um, you know, spy movie, psychedelic paranoia kinds of zones, that's just part of the fabric of reality now. So we got to get good at navigating this stuff and not just trying to put it in a box. And Wilson was, was pretty good at navigating this stuff. You know, you could critique him in some ways. In some ways, he, he was probably a little bit, uh, he probably played with the gullible a little bit more than he should have. But, you know, in any case, he, he was definitely someone who was trying to uh, walk with his tightrope, uh, walk as a tightrope walker into these, realms. And one thing he talked about was this place that'll, that people find themselves in called Chapel Perilous. And what Chapel Perilous was, it's, a, it's from the Grail myth, myths, but in Wilson's interpretation, it's basically a place where you've been following these strange lines of implication, you going down rabbit holes in, in the internet, or, you know, the other the earlier forms of archives, uh, or your own psychedelic experience, or your own uh, dream life and synchronicities and everything starting to connect and you know you're you, then you find yourself in this place where you can't go back you're like oh oh the door's shut behind me I can't just go oh this is all a bit much I'm just going to return to my ordinary life because the implications are too much the narrative has swallowed you up and he says like when you're in Chapel Perilous there's only two ways out you either come out a stone cold paranoid or you come out a radical agnostic. And there's a lot of wisdom in that, a lot of wisdom in that. And because radical agnostic, if we want to avoid the stone cold paranoid, which unfortunately it feels like a lot of people aren't, um, then we have to move, you can't go back. 
You have to go forward. And what does that mean? That means even more skepticism. The problem, one of the main problems that a lot of conspiracy theory people go through, it's, some, it's something that a, 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 a writer on, on the net described as freshman skepticism, which is that you learn the first stage of radical skepticism about the narratives you've gotten, the media, the stories. It's like, you know, who says we're, we're on a, on a three-dimensional ball floating through the, the earth? Like, you know, maybe these guys have been lying to us all the time. So you, you learn that the real power of skepticism, which is an extraordinary, it's like an acid. It just eats through everything. And you use it just enough to get, pull away from a, a consensus view. And then where are you? Well, then you're like locked into some weird internet subculture, you know, long tail echo chamber. And then you're like, yeah, I'm home. I found my tribe. And, and you find these people and they just iterate the same stuff you've heard from the guy next to them. So they haven't freed themselves from collective narratives, from collective stories, a lot of them. They just get away from the first layer and get stuck in the second. But the radical agnostic goes, well, how do I, why should I trust this weird guy over here and with his videos? Why do I trust these conspiracy narratives? Why do I trust my own fear? And, and so there's a way of going deeper and deeper and deeper into skepticism where you pop out and you're like, okay, I, I really can't really ground any of my beliefs. I can see the way that mathematics has these self-contradictory elements to them. I can see the way that you know, physics is contradictory in all sorts of ways. And which physics are we talking about? And will there ever be one physics? Unlikely. You realize how multiplicitous, how chaotic, how multidimensional the world is, but you're okay with that because you're, you're kind of back. You're back with a difference. You're back with like, well, but I'm in this condition where I'm making decisions, I'm building models of the world, I'm talking to people that I can resonate with and we're helping each other clarify how we get through, that you know, science can give us a lot of information about what's going on, but you hold everything more lightly. You hold everything sort of gingerly and you're aware that it can go south or turn under or the rug can be pulled out from under you at any time so that when that happens, you're not terrified, you don't lose the plot, you're like, oh, it's the crazy part again, or oh, now I'm paranoid today. Yeah, it's all coming together. Okay, well, let's try to navigate this. Be, be nice to people. Don't hurt myself. You know, it, it, in a weird way, it comes back to being very pragmatic and very realistic, but you're not clinging onto these totalizing narratives anymore. And that's where people get stuck, because that's scary. I mean, it's scary to believe that Bill Gates is making a vaccine that we're gonna, he's gonna force us all to take and it's got a microchip and they're gonna control us. Yeah, that's pretty scary. It's like a, a weird fiction or I love, a, I love weird fiction. I love horror, I love science fiction. You know, it's another one of those and it's scary if you think it's true. But it's a lot scarier to go in some ways, the world is a chaos that nobody knows is really going on. Nobody knows. And if you think that there's a captain of the ship and you finally get there and you get into the, 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 the captain's chamber, it's empty. There's just committees and, and fights and negotiations and different models. And that's us riding history, riding this flowing chaos of a wave. And there you are waking up to it, you know, having ultimate responsibility, but also realizing you don't know what's going on. And that's a very psychedelic moment. And you're, then there's the next day. How are you gonna live with that? Well, get out of cha Chapel Perilous, man. Get, in, get into like, if, if that's the way you've gone, embrace radical agnosticism, embrace not knowing, but not, not a one that, forced, that disenables you from making decisions. It's, it's, it's a paradox in a way, but not totally. And it's, to my mind, a very, um, it's like a mature psychedelia or a, a mature kind of a, a skepticism where you're, you're going for it, but you don't stop from, from you know, taking it all the way down and then having to come back because there you are, you're still making decisions. Do I do this? Do I do that? You can't just say, I don't know, it's all, a, it's all fake or whatever. It doesn't work. So 
that's my hope, you know, or it's, and it's not for everybody. It's just for people, I think, who find themselves going in these weird ways that, as I said, with conspiracy theory, are now just part of mediated reality. So you have people who have no psychedelic experience, who don't think about this, these ways, who just don't know the history of conspiracy theory, just tuning into this stuff and really getting lost really fast. And I, I know people personally, I've seen a lot of people in the new age world and the yoga world and the psychedelic world, Burning Man world, all these worlds that I'm kind of part in and part out, uh, just lose the plot, get, get, get absorbed into narratives that are being manipulated by other levels of narrative and other players for very specific reasons. So uh, mm. it's a time for, uh, for, for some of these tools to, to spread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, it, it's really interesting. I mean, we did a whole series on conspiracy. So I kind of looked into it. And there's something, it is very psychoactive. The whole, the whole area of conspiracy theory is very psychoactive. And one of the best summaries of why that is came from a friend of mine who says that it's, a lot of it is very archetypal material. We're Absolutely. moving into, we're moving into like mythopoetic realms. And if you're not careful at some point, you actually start chasing Satan. Like there's, there's all of these kind of really deep religious archetypes and for example like projecting satan onto bill gates classic one that you sort of see people doing constantly online but at the same time you can't reject it wholesale either because the, the, a friend of mine also said that there's some, in some sense becoming a conspiracy theorist theorist is probably a necessary initiation for all of us I, like I, when once we let go of consensus reality going through that process is almost like a necessary initiation now I, I think that's I think that's really true. Another thing that that reminds me of is what one of the things I was trying to do in in high weirdness when I was looking at at all the stories and visions and books that these um, psychonauts had had come up with is to take them seriously, but not take them literally. And the the instinctive mainstream response to conspiracy is to not take it literally or seriously. Uh, or you go over to the other side and you take it seriously and you take it literally. And then a lot of things have been, have been set up. So it's one of those, in a way, it's another aspect of this practice of agnosticism where I, like, I go into it and I go, no, there's something here. What is it? What is that for? And part of it, I think, is a revelation of these archetypal narratives, these unconscious fears and phantasms like Satan, like the end of the world, like the saved re re remnants. And a lot of them, by the way, are Christian. And I think that part of the problem with conspiracy theory is that, how to say this, is that it, it initiates you into a kind of realm of the imaginal that again, we have to take seriously, that it's not just fantasies or uh, you know, dream patterns in some dusty book, that like the imaginal is no joke. It's part of our world, it's part of who we are. And you get in there and you're like, whoa, what's going on here? And there are certain patterns that have, humans have used to kind of organize it. And the Christian one has a certain, uh, has, has some features of it that make it attractive. And one of those is that it's very clear, there's a good and an evil, and I'm on the good side. And then that gives me a purpose in life which is to spread the message of good and evil. So I'll, now I'm going to propagate the conspiracy theory. And it's all in relationship to a moment in the near future where everything is going to come apart or it's all going to be revealed. You know, in UFO stuff, they talk about disclosure. And UFO folks have been talking about disclosure for decades and we get little bits of it. You know, it's the authorities even play with it. They give you, you know, the Air Force gives you a few bits and you're like, that's it. Disclosure is just around the corner. But it's a, it's a pattern. It's a way of organizing history that's very rooted in a kind of Christian way of looking at it. I prefer a more shamanic view of the imaginal world. And I think that that is a more mature, psychedelically informed kind of view. And that's one in which you're like, welcome to a world with many ambiguous players. What looks like evil may not be so evil. What looks like good may not be so good. And you and yours have to kind of navigate this through alliances and practices and your own uh, sort of autonomous 
ability to navigate that zone rather than joining the army of the good against the army of, of the devil. And so that's, I think, a dimension that's going on with this idea that you're, that you're talking about as a, kind of, as a kind of initiation. But in a more grounded way, um, I would also say that the, the way that a lot of conspiracy theories are true is that they are, let's call them allegories for real conditions of real power whose implications are both harrowing enough and difficult enough to pin down that you can't really get there through conventional means of journalism, investigative journalism, academic study, da da da. It just it sort of eludes that. So that you know the degree to which pharmaco pharmacology and 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 you know uh, the corporations that make pill like that they maintain such a massive influence over media, over our self image. Uh, over our medicine, the, the very things we take into our bodies, you know, from a alien anthropologist point of view, it's this totally weird, you know, dark, dark, white coated shamanism that has works, but doesn't work. And I mean, it's so, it's so vast that you can't really get there with just like, even, you know, even if you follow like the Oxycontin trail and go, how did they, how did we end up like, addicting millions of Americans with these powerful drugs that we knew were bad. Like, how does that happen? And you can go through as an investigative journalist and track, okay, this family, these guys made this decision. Here's this regulatory agency. Here are these lobbyists, blah, blah, blah. And you get this kind of murky story that never really ends and hardly anybody ever takes responsibility for it. And that may be the best we can do with that medium. But on another level, the horror of that like the horror of that, where are you going to put that? You put it in the imagination. And so then when you get a Bill Gates vaccine microchip story, you're like the affect, the emotional energy that is animating that story, that's true. That, or it, it's responsive to a real uh, situation. And that's another thing I, I, that I recommend people who are going through this realm is to become very good at picking apart the affect or the emotion from the narrative. And that this is true of you too. Like when something is, seems exciting or seems attractive, seems to be true, what is, it, what is it pulling out of you emotionally? Not the story emotionally because a lot of the manipulation a lot of the narrative manipulation that we see it has to do with figuring out which of many stories are best able to trigger and capture these emotions which most of us aren't as aware of which are sometimes very powerful fear dread lust resentment bitterness hatred i mean powerful stuff we are like crazy animals and if you get the right narrative, oh, I've got it, you know? And I learned this listening to a lot of right-wing radio back in the day, you know, be, you know, kind of before, well, I mean, you know, it still it continues on in, in its glories, but this was like, you know, 20, 30 years ago when it was really just sort of bubbling up. And it was always so interesting because you could just hear the way the host was sort of like, T retelling a story about like immigrants. Okay, all the immigrants, they come in here and da da da. Oh wait, a ding, now you're getting all these calls. God damn these people, ah, they're da da da. And you realize that it, it's not actually about the language or the concepts or the political models. It's about bitterness and resentment and powerlessness and fear and stirring that stuff up and getting it to stick on certain narratives. And that's how a lot of narrative control happens. And so that also gives you a way of appreciating what's going on with conspiracy theory, because a lot of the emotions are really heavy. They're really dark. It is not an accident. It's very important to understand that at the heart of QAnon, which is this vast, influential, you know, right-wing Trump, pro-Trump, I don't even call it right-wing, I'll call it Trump conspiracy theory uh, that actually has, you know, people who believe it are running for office for, for you know, in, in, in the federal government right now as we speak in the United States, that at the heart of this is in some ways 
the worst thing that any of us can imagine, the ritualized sexual abuse of children. Horrible, impossible to think about without this murky slime of feeling arising. And it's so easy to weaponize anger, self-justification. That's it. That's my line in the sand. All of that, those emotions that come up out of the horror of that reality. And unfortunately, it is a reality. It's part of our human darkness, which we'll, we've never gotten out of and we're unlikely to ever get out of. But it's not an excuse, but it's just part of it. But it's focused in there because of the way that that generates so much affect and energy and emotion. So to go into that seriously, but not literary, liter, uh, li literal world is also a kind of uh, process of your own like emotional risk, because you got to kind of get close to a lot of things that are very difficult, you know, and so it's, it's, it's hard stuff, but I think it's also really key, because you're right, once you fall away from the from the mainstream story and you start to go, whoa, things are not, we're not in Kansas anymore. Inevitably, those, uh, those narratives, some of which have things that are true in them, some of which are even largely true as at least allegorically, they're right there waiting for you with all those people and all that self-reinforcing kind of counter narrative ready to absorb you. And if you want to stay sovereign in the sense that I know that, that you, you know, rebel wisdom is, is partly about that sense of being an autonomous thinker who's moving through these realms that aren't, we're not, we don't really have a good guide for, then it's really important to be aware and process that spiritual, emotional level and recognize what's going on in other people uh, because it's sort of like the main story, even though it doesn't necessarily look like it. We've sure. got to keep, keep alert to what's going on and, and do the work. Yeah, just to, just to, file, to keep on that, keep alert to what's going on but that your own emotions are not secondary to that process. And indeed we're being asked to become more clear about our own emotional processing because that's part of both the way we get captured and it's also part of the way that we step forward and move forward with, with more coherence and, uh, and light. Great. Thank you very much, Eric, for making the time and I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Absolutely, great to be here, David, thanks. Okay, bro. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.